All right, welcome everybody to our summer lecture series here at Radical Health. We're so happy you could join us. Here's our schedule for the rest of the upcoming series. And uh, next week, Tim will be presenting on CB1 antagonists, the history and future. So it's definitely something you're gonna wanna see. And uh, you can see the rest of the schedule here, but we'll go ahead and remind everybody by sending out our reminders. Um, and just a quick reminder here to join the Radical community. It is free and you can find it on our website. You'll see archived videos of previous presentations. Um, there's also our YouTube channel, which has lots of great content on it. And uh, like I said, it's free and you'll get updates about any time we're doing a free presentation. But if you find that you want more education and continuing education credits, if you're a nurse, you can check out our paid content on our website as well, um, where we have lots of different options for you to go through and increase your cannabis knowledge. Um, and if you guys didn't hear, it sounds like the FDA and the Health and Human Services have um, announced that they hope to reschedule cannabis by the end of the year. And rumors are that it's going to be a schedule three. So education is going to be really important really, really soon. So I wanna to present today on cancer pain and the use of cannabinoids to help reduce overall opioid intake. Uh, one of the things that I've been blessed to do is work at Stanford where they've completely embraced my cannabis education and allow me full autonomy and authority to use cannabis as a treatment option in our palliative care patient population. And as you know, they often are cancer patients, so if you don't know, um, and they have a lot of pain. Malignant pain is probably one of the hardest pains to treat. And many of these patients can end up on high levels of opioids, which of course come with their own set of concerns and side effects. <clears throat> so about 20 to 50% of cancer patients are going to experience pain and approximately 80% with advanced stage cancer will have moderate to severe pain. Um, so these are our stage three and stage four cancer patients. Younger patients are more likely to experience pain flares in older patients. We'll see the primary tumor is the main reason for pain in about 68% of these cancer patients, but we can also see pain occur from surgery, radiation, and even chemotherapy itself. And pre-existing non-malignant pain in cancer patients like low back pain, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, migraines hasn't been well studied. And they guesstimate it's between two and 76%, which is kind of, I think their way of saying, we just don't know. So again, cancer pain can be post-operative pain. We can have patients who may have had a mastectomy, uh, colorectal cancer, where they still have pain after the surgery, infusion-related syndromes. So sometimes these chemotherapies can cause additional pain syndromes like peripheral neuropathy. Um, Treatment-related mucositis, when they get those mouth sores, that can be some of the most painful um, pain that they have because the cells in our mouth are regenerating so quickly. It's just they can't eat, they can't swallow, they lose weight, really poor quality of life. Bone pain, often from metastases, um, chemotherapy-related musculoskeletal pain. I'll see this a lot in our breast cancer patients when they go on to their um, hormone therapies, sometimes they just have uh, what we call um, arthralgias and myalgias, achy body, achy joints. It's almost like they feel like they have the flu all the time. And then we can have dermatological complications like uh, herpatic neuralgia, dermatitis, hand foot syndrome, and radiation induced pain. Sometimes can be like a sunburn where they just get terrible uh, redness and pe uh, peeling skin in the area. Quality of life and cancer pain, this is an area where I think we could do a lot better. Um, there's an increased risk of developing depression with increased duration and severity of pain. So when their pain is undertreated, they're likely to be depressed. 28 to 55% of cancer patients are unable to work. Think about that. Almost half, a fourth to a half of cancer patients are unable to work. Cancer pain can persist post-treatment. So even with some of these earlier cancers where they're curative, we'll see 20 to 50% of patients experience pain and decreased functionality for years after their treatment. And many of them are <laughs> not being well-managed. Um, untreating pain can lead to increased requests for physician-assisted suicide, increased hospitalization, and emergency department visits. It's very distressing for patients. 
So what does the uh, cancer industry recommend for pharmacological treatments for cancer pain? Well, as you can imagine, it's things like acetaminophen, celecoxib, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like our ibuprofen, opioids, and other adjuvant pain medications. And you can see on this list, as you get to the bottom, ketamine is actually listed, but cannabinoids are not. So why is that? Well, we don't have a lot of studies looking specifically at using cannabinoids for cancer pain. Now we know that the National Academy of Sciences has come out and said that there is conclusive evidence that cannabinoids are effective for chronic pain in adults, but it doesn't specifically look at cancer pain. In fact, here, right here, you'll see we have one controlled trial of cannabinoid-based medicine for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. It was a study that included 16 patients. We have two ongoing trials currently listed in clinicaltrials.gov specifically for can cannabinoids and cancer pain. One is hemp-based CBD and the other is a THCBD. Non-neuropathic pain trials with cannabis-based medicines have been limited to nabix uh, nabiximols or Sativex. They did a meta-analysis of six randomized controlled studies with 1,400 plus cancer patients and found no difference in pain scores between nabiximals and placebo. So the evidence isn't great, and I can see why clinicians, particularly cancer oncologist clinicians, aren't really considering cannabis. So this was a study that was actually done uh, preclinical looking at cannabinoid, sorry, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. Um, we know that if the neuropathy is bad enough in humans, it can limit their dose. Often they have to do a dose reduction. Um, reducing those doses may decrease their chances of getting to progression-free survival. Um, and we also know that it can be lasting even after they're finished with their chemotherapy. So, you know, we don't have a lot of tools in our toolbox for um, neuropathic pain. But in this preclinical study, they assessed whether CBD could prevent chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy from paxitaxel, which is often given to our breast cancer patients. They did two and a half to five milligrams per kilogram of CBD and gave it 15 minutes before they got their chemotherapy. And the development of chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy was prevented in the rodents that received CBD without compromising the anti-tumor effects of paxitaxel on breast cells. And I think this is really important because many patients worry about whether cannabinoids are going to interact with their medications and even their chemotherapy. And so far, there hasn't been any information to address specifically chemotherapy. There has been with immune therapy, though. We know that CBD is a full agonist at the 5-HT1A and TRPV1 receptors, and these bindings may be responsible for the efficacy of CBD. So there was a recent article that came out at looking at uh, cannabis clinical recommendations. And this is just a summary of the paper. Um, they found that cannabinoid used in chronic pain, again, in cancer, not specifically cancer pain, had additional benefits of improved quality of life, functionality, mood, and decrease in pain severity, intensity, and interference. I know I'm speaking to the choir here. I think we all believe that cannabinoids can help with cancer pain and chronic pain. But there was strong evidence to find that cannabinoids can be effective as a monotherapy. So it doesn't necessarily need to be combined with anything else, a replacement therapy, which is what we're gonna get into here, and or an adjunct therapy in neuropathic pain, muscular and neuropathic pain in people with HIV, multiple sclerosis, arthritic conditions, fibromyalgia, Chronic pain that's not well controlled with opioids was also found to be effective with cannabinoids. So oral morphine intake that was greater than 50 showed opioid sparing effects when cannabinoids were added. So what are some of the long-term effects and harms of cannabis for cancer pain? Well, this was an article that I just had to include because it made me laugh. Um, very low certainty evidence suggests that adverse events are common among uh, chronic pain patients using medical cannabis. <laughs> Again, I think we know this, right? Um, the side effects that they found was in one to in 20 patients experienced an adverse effect. I mean, low incidence, right? Um, and what we saw was dizziness and dry mouth, impairment, cognitive change, dependence, and withdrawals 
And we know that we can probably avoid a lot of these side effects if they're working with a clinician who is knowledgeable in cannabis to help them control their dose and make sure they get the right cannabinoid profile. Um, very few patients are likely to experience these serious adverse effects. And when they stop using the cannabinoids, they usually resolve. What about the long-term effects of opioids in cancer chronic pain? Well, the risk for adverse effects includes neurotoxicity. So you can also see dizziness, sedation, fractures, which is interesting, cardiovascular events, breathing problems, especially with sleep. We know that opioids can suppress the um, brainstem that controls our breathing and our heart rate, hyperalgesia, tooth decay, bowel obstruction, misuse, and overdose. And of course, the risk increases with the dose. Now, if anybody wants to put in the chat why they think fractures might be associated with long-term effects of opioids, feel free to put in your thoughts there. Uh, maintenance of long-term analgesic efficacy has not been studied. So we leave patients on these opioids for long periods of time, and we don't necessarily know if it does them any good, right? It's rare that we bring them down or deschedule or um, deprescribe. So let's look at the difference between cannabinoids and opioids. With opioids, um, patients are often prescribed by a healthcare professional for them, and they're, they're managed, they're followed. Um, people are making sure that they're using the right um, laxatives so that they don't have bowel issues, but patients are often having to self-manage cannabinoids. Um, they're not covered by insurance, right? So what becomes one of the biggest barriers for patients is cost. Clinicians are not up to date with cannabinoid research and lack the ability to guide patients on how to optimize their cannabinoid therapies. Um, I see over and over again, I had, um, I'm going to do some case studies, but I had a prostate cancer patient who um, came to me because he was trying to get up to a full gram of THC oil a day for his cancer and he could not function. He was, um, he said, I, I, I use it for sleep though. It really helps me sleep. And I said, I think I can help you sleep without having to take, you know, 450 milligrams of THC a night. Um, dosing guidelines remain sparse. They're often based on anecdotes. So we're lacking these randomized controlled studies to measure the effects of cannabis use on patient outcomes, it's still federally illegal. Um, and state level research demonstrates a correlation between cannabis programs and lower opioid related mortality rates and decreased prescription use and cost in Medicare patients. There's so much reason for us to be offering these to our patients. Here's just a little chart that I put together. It is not um, exhaustive, but it looks at the adverse effects and whether you would see it with cannabinoids, opioids, or both. Um, opioids wins, right? All of these adverse effects are things that you can experience with opioids, but not necessarily with cannabinoids. And some of them are really only associated with THC and with um, heavy and chronic use of THC. So again, what does it look like when a patient is being monitored and given you know, safe and effective dosing? We don't know other than what we've experienced ourselves anecdotally. Um, you'll see immunosuppressive effects with THC. And so this is <clears throat> what I mentioned earlier in our cancer patients. There's not any evidence that cannabinoids will affect the chemotherapy efficacy, but there is some data that THC specifically and maybe CBD can suppress the effects of immunotherapy. So it means that patients may not have the response to immunotherapy that they would expect because the use of the cannabinoids. So opioid sparing effects. Anytime I can help my patients reduce or even eliminate their use of opioids, I feel like it's such a huge win. Not only are we dealing with the stigma and the crisis, opioid crisis here, we're dealing with the fact that now these um, pharmacies who have been sued have changed their policies. So like CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens here in California, have changed their policies to where they are not ordering as much opioids as they used to. So what happens is a lot of times our cancer patients can't get the supply that they need. Perfect example, I have a post-operative um, cancer patient who had um, ovarian cancer. She had a complete debulking. She had 
um, an ostomy and she needs Dilaudid and MS Compton. And one pharmacy had 12 pills. Another pharmacy had eight pills. She had to go to all these different pharmacies to be able to get her supply. And what happens is when we report that, it now looks like she's diverting and she's a drug user. So patients are really, really getting stuck with opioids. There's this meta-analysis of observational studies that found about 39% reported opioid cessation with the use of cannabinoids and 85% reported reduction in their opioid intake. The summary was that preclinical and observational studies demonstrate the potential opioid sparing effects of cannabinoids in the context of analgesia. And Delta-9, I know this isn't surprising to most of us, was identified as the most effective cannabinoid with opioid sparing effects. Patients really need to have THC in their regimen in order to get that pain relief. This is a large prospective study of Canadian medical cannabis patients. They looked at uh, 1,145 patients with a little over half being female and the median age being 52. They were evaluated on their initial visit at one month, three months, and six months, and found that 28% of patients were using opioids at baseline, but only 11% were using them at six months. And their daily oral morphine equivalent went from 152 milligrams at baseline to 32.2 milligrams at six months, which represented a 78% reduction in their oral morphine equivalent. That is phenomenal. So I wanna present a couple cases for you guys. Um, so I wanna leave time for Q&A here. Um, and this is just some of the work I've been able to do specifically at Stanford to help some of these patients reduce their overall oral morphine intake, equivalent intake. Now, this is a 54 year old male. He had acute myeloid uh, leukemia. He was status post a bone marrow transplant, which was complicated by graft versus host disease of the gut. And unfortunately they can have a lot of pain from graft versus host disease. He was sent to us an outpatient palliative clinic for chronic abdominal and back pain nausea, depression, anxiety. Um, again, a lot of times these patients who have chronic pain, malignant pain from cancer often have other symptoms, right? The depression, the anxiety, the poor sleep. And cannabis is often able to help with multiple symptoms rather than us prescribing multiple different medications. He was taking oxycodone five milligrams three times a day with worsening mood and hopelessness. So he was actually having some depression from his pain pills. He initiated inhaled cannabis, which resulted in decreased pain, nausea, and improvement in mood. However, the bone marrow transplant team really did not want him to continue inhaling cannabis. Um, there's a lot of concerns around contamination, particularly fungal pneumonia in post-BMT patients, which while the incident is really, really, really rare, um, I think you know, long-term best for this patient was to get him on. Um, some kind of oral cannabis, um, which we did, and he was able to taper off his opioids completely. This is an 82 year old male with prostate cancer, widely metastatic to the bone, and their cancer can be extremely painful. Came in to see palliative care in a wheelchair, complained of severe pain, seven to eight out of 10, um, limiting his ability to walk and participate in activities. So, poor quality of life. He was started on methadone five milligrams nightly and oxycodone five milligrams as needed. He was noted to have increased drowsiness with opioids, didn't like the way he felt, so was asked if he could try cannabis. Initiated two drops of CBD at three times a day and five milligrams of THC lozenge at bedtime. Within a month, the patient had stopped all opioids, pain was controlled, and he was actually able to ambulate with a walker. For the win. Uh, this 64 year old male with prostate cancer, extensive bone metastases. I'm still working full time, took a lot of pride in his job, did not want to stop working. Reported his pain at a three out of four out of 10, but his wife observed that when the pain reached that level, he was often in bed and immobile. So um, we had to have a discussion around what is really considered severe pain. Um, we started him on hydrocodone, 5, 325 every four hours. He took one a day. He didn't like the effects of how the opioids made him feel, but he really wasn't functioning. He wasn't able to continue working full-time, which is important to him. So I started him on morphine, 15 milligrams, three times a day, because um, he was also not really compliant with taking the hydrocodone. 
he was taking about 50 milligrams of a moral equivalent a day, um, morphine equivalent a day. He continued to have pain that was not well controlled. So we started him on five milligrams of gummies every four hours as needed for pain. He ended up taking three a day, 15 milligrams of THC. And then it came up in one of the visits that the wife's father was a grower um, and he had jars of cannabis and she wanted to know if it was okay if he inhaled. And so we added an inhalation, which was the most effective for his pain his appetite and his nausea. And he actually maintained this morphine dose um, up until he went into hospice last week. So the cannabis was so, so important to him in controlling his pain. And, you know, one of the concerns that the wife had was when he was transitioning to hospice last week, his liver <clears throat> was so dysfunctional that I think he was starting to get, um, you know, some confusion and, um, I said, she said, I'm concerned that he's not going to be able to smoke for much longer, which really controls his pain. And I remember talking, I hope it's okay, Alice. I remember talking to Alice O'Leary about when she was with Bob and he was at the end of the life, his life. And she said, I would, I would inhale the cannabis and I would blow it in his face. And so I gave her that recommendation and, you know, hopefully that will bring him some relief. He was able to continue working on that plan up until he went into hospice last week. So opioid reduction recommendations, your patients using cannabis and they're having success and they wanna reduce their opioids, what's next? Well, this is just a little bit about how I practice. Um, I'll usually start with one dominant cannabinoid at a time. So if it's CBD, it's usually full spectrum. Um, THC, there may be other cannabinoids in there, but it's predominantly the THC or the CBD I'm focusing on. I'll add in other cannabinoids as needed and tolerated. So depending on how they do, um, I may add in THC if they started with CBD, and that can be at 0.5 to 3 milligrams per dose, and then increasing by 1 to 2 milligrams every couple of days. I also try to consider a daytime and a nighttime regimen because it really helps patients achieve quality of life with minimal side effects. And I also consider acidic cannabinoids to help patients achieve relief at lower dosages because again, the acidics are thought to be more water soluble and better absorbed by the body. And then initiate opioid tapering once a patient's achieved a, uh, improvement in pain. And this is just a guideline, five to 10% of their um, morphine equivalent every one to four weeks. Some patients can go faster. Some really want to go slower than that. So it can be individualized based on how your patient's tolerating it. This is our equal analgesic chart that we put together here at Radical Health when we found some evidence that um, 30 milligrams of codeine is equal to five milligrams of THC. So we tried to do some uh, conversion here with the other opioids to help people figure out how many milligrams of THC would be equivalent to that opioid. Um, this is not evidence-based. It has not been studied, but it is one of our uh, hopes that we can get this into a study and see if there's any validity to it. Uh, additional considerations, things to talk about in the Q&A piece. What would it look like for patients if they had more clinical guidance on cannabinoid usage, routes, dosing, chemo bars, product selection? Um, don't forget THC is necessary for cancer pain management and opioid reduction. Even small dosages can make a big difference. And clinical success can be measured through reduction in pain intensity, opioid use, improved quality of life, decreased opioid-related adverse effects. And some recommendations for practice. Consider multiple different routes of administration to address the chronic cancer pain. Consider full spectrum products when available and specific terpene profiles if available. Don't be afraid to increase THC based on tolerability and side effects. Consider opioid reduction once pain is responding to cannabis regimen. And cannabis needs may change when reducing other medications and once the patient has stopped pain medications. So be open-minded, curious, and flexible on whether or not your patient needs changes there. And with that, I'm ready for Q&A.